so in this image, uh, doctor, it's kind of hard to see. Um, what, in your review, did you determine whether there was the possibility that controlled substances were uh, ingested at the time of approach by officers King and Lane? Yes. And what do you see in this image, 1059, that is consistent with that? In the back corner of Mr. Floyd's mouth, you can see what appears to be a white object. Are you talking? This object right there? Oops. Just slightly higher up than that, yes. Yeah. Well, how about don't you do it? Sorry, I covered it with the dot, but that's what I'm referring to. All right. You can see just underneath the dot. Now, in the next image, 1060, what appears to ha be happening? In this particular image, it appears that Mr. Floyd is looking away, <coughs> away from, excuse me, <coughs> um, from Officer Lane. And looking at the time stamps, that's approximately one second later? Yes. And in the third image, uh, does he appear to be looking at Officer Lane again? Yes. And do you see that same object in his mouth? I can, yes. You can. And so you be, what does this lead you to conclude, or what do you strike at? Oops. We could do this. In terms of the uh, later analysis there, you understand there was some evidence collected from the backseat of Squad 320? That is my understanding, yes. And do you know what that substance was? The, there was some material there that had saliva and DNA on it that matched Mr. Floyd, and those, I believe, and the, those objects had fentanyl and um, methamphetamine, if my memory serves me correctly. So is that what you conclude your uh, analysis on in terms of the ingestion of controlled substances as far as the timing in this case, both before they were approached as well as during in the backseat of the squad car? Yes. Again, um, you know, some technical difficulties, uh, you know, an oops here, an oops there. But at the end of the day, he's going to use it in his closing argument as part of uh, the evidence that he says proves George Floyd ingesting drugs that day. Julie Janae, Court TV legal correspondent, joins us from Minnesota, uh, from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota tonight. Julie, we've known about this for quite some time because uh, the folks at Court TV, like you, go through the court file, and we know that uh, attorneys have pointed this out before. But this is the first time the jury's ever been made aware of this alleged uh, white dot in George Floyd's mouth. Right, Vinny, I had to remind myself of that because we have known about it for months, but it had not come up in this trial until now. The defense zooming in on that dot. I think it's interesting that the state never brought it up because they did a really good job of trying to get ahead of all of the things that they anticipated the defense was going to try and bring up and any of the arguments that were going to be made. But in this case, this jury was seeing Dr. Fowler make that suggestion that what's in George Floyd's mouth was either a pill or a uh, some type of drug that he ingested and then turned away and it was gone if you look at the body camera footage but we've never known exactly what that white dot is yeah it's it it's interesting because on cross-examination uh jerry blackwell addressed this situation let's take a look can you see a white substance in george floyd's mouth there i can uh and doesn't it look remarkably similar to the white substance that you were talking about uh, when uh, 
you uh, were discussing the photograph with the gun pointed at him and the car when he was first approached by the police. Yes, it looks very similar. Uh, is it your understanding that when Mr. Floyd left Cup Foods, he went out across the street to sit in the vehicle? Yes. And next he was then approached by the police sitting in the vehicle, right? I believe he was first approached by the clerks from the store and then he was approached by the police subsequently. So would it be fair to say, in order to say that the white substance in Mr. Floyd's mouth was a pill, in light of what you've seen, that would be jumping to a conclusion, wouldn't it? Specifically, when I testified, I said there was a white object in his mouth. That's all I could discern from that, and I remember saying that um, under direct. So you were not then either telling or suggesting to the jury that the white substance was a pill, are you? I never said it was a pill. I carefully said that I could see a white Dr. structure in his Dr. mouth. Dr. Fowler, if you just and, answer and my question. I did not want to classify it, and I didn't classify it. If you just it. answer my question. Yes. You're not either telling or suggesting to the jury that the white substance was a pill, are you? No. I never did. All right, Julie J, let's, do, let's go through the timeline here a little bit. So you've got this now video from Cup Foods with a white dot in George Floyd's mouth. Um, and in between that time and when the officer approaches him, a, a lot of things happen, right? I mean, there's, there's a little bit of a passage of time. And, and, and George Floyd's, what exactly is he doing from that period to that period, from the testimony that we've heard? Well, we know that he was then inside his vehicle for a long amount of time. There were two times that the Cup Foods clerk came out to the vehicle and uh, reportedly Floyd was asleep inside the car, or falling asleep. Shawanda Hill was inside the car with him. So was Maurice Hall. There was interaction with the clerk. Then the police were called. Then Thomas Lane arrived on the scene with J. Alexander King, went into the Cup Foods and then approached George Floyd. So there is this passage of time, I believe it's around 20 minutes, that he was in the Cup Foods and then that initial police encounter. So there is some time, but this explains why the state didn't get ahead of this in their case in chief, because they wanted to wait until the defense brought this out to then uh, really have a mic drop moment showing him inside the Cup Foods with a similar white dot in his mouth. Yeah, I think and he's couple, chewing. That's right. something that they brought out. They said, doesn't it look like he's chewing in that video to indicate this is likely gum or candy or something or could be just throwing the right. doubt in that it is what the defense wants to suggest it is. Right. So if you go in 20 minutes, I don't know if a, a, a pill lasts 20 minutes necessarily in your mouth. I, I'm not sure. Candy, unless it's an everlasting gobstopper, is not going to last that long. But gum would. Gum would. Let's bring our guests into this conversation. Uh, joining us from Chicago, Illinois, trial attorney David Otunga and in New York City, criminal defense attorney, civil rights attorney Ron Kuby. Great to have you both here. Uh, David Otunga, I, I think we've talked about this before, this uh, little white dot, perhaps uh, pre-trial. I'm not sure. Uh, but your thoughts about what it is and what the jury may think it is. Well, I think, you know, like you said, if it's a pill, how long do you keep a pill in your mouth? Take it in there, you drink something, or even if you don't, you swallow it. A pill is in your mouth 30 seconds tops, and that's being conservative. I think this is clearly gum. Looked like he was chewing it inside the store. Also, this could explain the white stuff on his mouth, because if you chew gum long enough, it can start to cake up. I know there's a particular gum I chew sometimes, and when it starts to get chalky like that, I got to spit it out. So I think more likely than not, this was gum, and I loved how the prosecution handled this today on cross because, I mean, it was a mic drop moment. It, it was kind of funny. Rod Kuby, the little white dot. <laughs> well, you know, was it a pill? Tic Tac? Piece of gum? Maybe it was two pills. Maybe he had one in the store uh, and then another one in the car. Uh, it doesn't really make any difference because you're totally unable to establish what it was. And, and Jerry Blackwell, you know, who is a, a very, very skilled attorney, made it clear that no one is saying this is a pill without even engaging in the argument of, well, what does it really matter? We know George Floyd was a drug addict. We've, we've done that ad nauseum. So the fact that he had taken a pill or would have taken a pill or maybe had taken a pill is a surprise to no one. 
All right, let's take a listen now to more uh, from Dr. David Fowler here uh, talking about the cause of death. Did you form ultimately opinions as to the cause and manner of death of Mr. Floyd? Yes. And um, what would those conclusions be? Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia due to hypertensive atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease during the restraint. Okay. And were there um, contributing causes? Yes. What are those? The substances, the fentanyl and the methamphetamine, the potential of a um, carbon monoxide roll, and the potential that the paraganglionoma was adding adrenaline to this whole um, mixture, uh, making things even worse. All right, Julie, today, uh, put some context. How, how does Dr. Fowler, uh, forensic pathologist, what does he agree with, with Dr. Baker, the medical examiner, and how does he differ from Dr. Baker? He starts off very similar, that cardiac arrest, the uh, sudden cardiac arrhythmia that uh, was caused by arteriosclerotic uh, hypertensive heart disease, all of that is in line with Dr. Baker's cause of death on the autopsy report. And then there's the during law restraint. Dr. Fowler uses the word during law restraint. Dr. Baker just says law restraint was part of the cause of death. And then there's the contributing factors, the fentanyl and the methamphetamine exposure. He agrees with Dr. Baker on that, but he also includes new things for this jury that they were taking note of. And that is the carbon monoxide exposure that he indicated when testifying that this was from the exhaust pipe from the squad vehicle that was dripping, uh, that was near Floyd's head while he was being arrested. And also that paraganglioma tumor that he testified floods the body with adrenaline. All of that contributing, he said, to mm -hmm. Floyd's death. The way that he characterizes the restraint is that it put stress on the heart and increased the demands that that heart needed, but ultimately saying it was not the restraint, it was Floyd's heart disease that caused this death. Ron Kuby, is this a reasonable alternative explanation for cause of death, which is all the defense needs to establish? Dr. Fowler is a legitimate expert. Uh, he's got legitimate credentials and substantial experience. This is not Dr. Phil that they put on the stand. So he, he, his testimony, to the extent that the, the jurors say to themselves, or a ju juror says to themselves, look, you've got these doctors and you've got this other doctor and they all have similar areas of expertise and they can't even agree as to what caused George Floyd's death. That is a reasonable doubt as to cause of death. And, and I think that might reach one or two people, but it doesn't change the fact that the overwhelming weight of the evidence and the overwhelming quality of the evidence, as demonstrated later on in the cross-examination of Dr. Fowler, still very much favors the prosecution. David Otunga, what did, what did you think? I mean, he came to a, a conclusion, you know, agrees with Baker in part, but there are some uh, definite uh, parting of the ways, especially with the um, non-pathologist uh, uh, testimony that we heard from prosecutors. Yeah, that's true. I mean, this goes to show that the litany of medical experts the prosecutors brought in was powerful. I mean, okay, you have Dr. Tobin. This guy was the star of the trial so far. Then you have Dr. Fowler. The guy is legitimate, you know, as Ron said. But the way he presented himself, he was counting on his fingers, taking forever. Like he was making this up as he goes along. Sometimes I don't even know if he was quite sure of himself. And, you know, I had to read it over again, you know, in the transcript, what he actually thought the cause of death was. And he said it's a, a sudden heart rhythm problem due to heart disease. However, it could be narrowed arteries, enlarged heart, methamphetamine, high blood pressure, stress of the situation, um, carbon monoxide. It could be. So basically, um, he could have died by any number of these things. And then when pressured, he said, oh, well, you know, I would characterize it as undetermined, undetermined. Great. So the defense has paid all this money. 
brought you in to say that George Floyd died, you know, by a heart attack or something, but then really it's undetermined. Like that was your one job. Your one thing was to determine the cause of death. Well, I'll just say it's undetermined. Uh, it, it. <laughs> it's, it's interesting because um, undetermined, if, if you can't specifically determine, that's reasonable doubt to a certain extent if the jury believes, well, you, we but, can't, you can't me, figure it me, out. But let me add something to that because there is something that he said that was consistent with Dr. Baker and pretty much all of the medical experts have agreed upon this. Every one of their reasonings for the cause of death also included um, complications from restraint. Complications from restraint. That clearly seems to be the cause of death because think about it. Let's say George Floyd did have a heart attack. Okay, that was caused by the officers sitting on his back or it was caused by the stress of the situation. Either way, their actions cause his death. Well um, stated. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I, I mean, with due respect, well stated, but but I, I, I think incorrect, at least according to the testimony, um, because we're talking about the primary cause or substantial cause. And, and I agree with you that Dr. Fowler was, was less than completely clear uh, but he did make it very clear that he did not regard the restraint as a primary cause of death. And I, I, I also think that to have him up there saying, you know, with all my expertise, I can't know and I don't know because there's too many factors at play. I think that plays better with a jury, frankly, than somebody who comes in completely confident yet, yes, I know this thing for sure. And frankly, undetermined is is just as good for the jury as, as saying that, you know, he died from a fentanyl overdose or had a sudden heart attack. Yeah, and, and, and but the point that David made that I thought was, uh, was fantastic. There's a common denominator. And while he says it's not the primary, ladies and gentlemen, everybody else does. So, um, right. all right. Well, well, okay. But, but the common denominator that, is also the drugs, right? Everybody okay. said the drugs were a contributing factor. Okay, that's another common denominator. But we nobody's saying do... that's the primary. So well, you... and but neither is Dr. But let's Fowler. Say George Floyd, let's say George Floyd was on drugs. He was under the influence, as the officers have stated many times. There's a little doctrine called the eggshell skull rule, where you take your witness as you find them. Let's say George Floyd was possibly had so much drugs that it may have killed him later. Is it not possible they could have killed him before a drug overdose? They knew that he was having a hard time breathing. They knew that he was under the effects of drugs. That's still a cause of death. You have to be aware of that. You think the guy's overdosing, sit him up. Don't have three people on his back preventing him from breathing. You know, let alone with a knee on his neck for nine minutes, 29 seconds, that's still a cause of death. I actually think the drugs still helps them. I hope the state uses this in their rebuttal argument. Jerry Blackwell, you can use it. This is a free one for you. All right. When we come back, we'll listen to uh, the cross-examination by Jerry Blackwell after we just heard Ron Kuby's cross-examination. Uh, Julia Janae will join us coming up uh, later on at the top of the hour. Don't go anywhere, folks. A lot more big moments to take a look at.